All right. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, so I'm supposed to tell you everything I know in 50 minutes. It's actually going to take 55 minutes. So we have to have to jump right in. I do want to talk to you about my idea of nature's best hope. Um, and, but I'll give you a teaser, a spoiler, whatever they call it. You are nature's best hope. So I'm really going to tell you about why I think so. But before I do that, let's talk about how to advance this. Not working. <laughs> It worked before, actually. So. Huh. It Either one. Or I could just tell you stories. There we go. I'll try advancing off. Okay. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. Wrong program. Okay. What was I saying? All right, let's. <clears throat> Let's talk about what E.O. Wilson's idea of, of nature's best hope was. E.O. Wilson, of course, a very famous entomologist, probably the most famous entomologist, uh, worked at Harvard for over 60 years. He died the day after Christmas two years ago, and it was a terrible loss to the world of conservation. But um, one thing that was consistent throughout his very long career was his love of life on planet Earth and his efforts to save it. And in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, and he had one simple message. That was, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Very bold statement, but he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He did not spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a, a conservation biologist, that's a wonderful idea. We'll just put half the Earth aside and everything is in trouble. It can be in that half and we'll be in the other half and it'll be great. Problem is, Half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and I don't see us getting rid of that anytime soon. And we've got 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our hardscape, our airports, our detritus, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we actually uh, do what EO suggests? I think that's really what I want to talk about today. We, we can realize EO Wilson's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened on the East Coast in 2019. And actually, it's happening again this year over much of the country. We had a very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. Then it forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that hole. Tight squeeze, and once it plops down out of the acorn, uh, that's a dangerous time for that insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface, takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. Uh, and then surprisingly stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but the, uh, it's actually an extension of the head capsules and their mouth parts are way down at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in that hole, and that is how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year the way most insects would? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum. You know that nature abhors a vacuum. In this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes that acorn weevils made after they left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited. Come on in, sit down. Can't stand there all day. <laughs> if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move the colony. It's time to grab the larvae, grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new acorn. That takes about 30 minutes. And once they're inside, then they post a guard, a little antennae up there, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point with this little story? 
That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature, largely interactions between animals and plants. This is, whoop, let's not forget this one. This is, this is an important interaction right here between jays, jays of all species and acorns. They're the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn, they'll fly up to a mile. Some people say a mile and a half from the parent tree, tap it below the soil, the surface. Uh, and the object is they're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this beautiful moth, the beloved E. marginia, unless you have mistletoe, that is its host plant, the only thing it can eat. You won't have mistletoe unless you have the oak trees to support that mistletoe. You won't have 60 species of, of native bees in the West if you don't have pollen from sunflowers. Turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got between 3,600 and 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. Uh, so my point here is that <clears throat> many of these specialized interactions, actually most of them these days, are declining. Uh, they're on the ropes. Nature itself is, is on the ropes. Uh, and it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we haven't left most of the country, particularly the lower 48 states as it was. There's only about 5% uh, of the lower 48 that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And you guys are lucky enough, you live right next to some of that. Uh, and it typically is, is mountaintops. Uh, and that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have drained it, we have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland out there. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. You can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need because it is nature, it is functioning ecosystems that sustain us on this planet. So why have we done that? I don't know. Uh, but I suspect we thought that, that our nest, planet Earth, was so small, I mean so large, that we could foul it forever uh, and, and uh, there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. That's why we're seeing some, some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? We're talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now the UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. And they said it two years ago, so that's the next 18 years now. This is a prediction, has not happened yet. Uh, and it's a prediction we have to make sure it does not happen because again, these are the species that run the ecosystems that support us. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the, the uh, environment as, as Shakespeare would say upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological and environmental benefits to everybody. Should we turn briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what would happen if insects were to disappear from planet Earth. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if that happened, it would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals would collapse. We would lose our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, and our mammals gone. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. 
And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. And finally, uh, there is some good news, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. I don't have to tell you folks that. There's a few of the things that, that plants do that uh, we depend on every day, like produce oxygen, like clean our water, slow its journey to the sea or becomes too salty to use, carbon capture, enormously important, not just to build their tissues out of it, but they pump the extra carbon into the ground through their root systems. Plants are building topsoil, holding it in plates. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. And that would be a real IT challenge. Maybe you're that right. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people that are demanding more and more ecosystem services every day. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves, they're doing the best they can, but we are in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced, uh, which means it's not good enough. But there is a simple solution, that is to start practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups who have been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the Earth uh, than, than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Adel Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called a land ethic. He wrote about it in uh, his most famous book, Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together. We cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. But what I want to uh, uh, emphasize this afternoon or today, whatever it is, is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. Most of the country, at least in the, in the lower 48 states, is privately owned. 78% of the whole country is privately owned. 85.6% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And let me remind you, we can't afford to fail. It's not an option. Now we use the word conservation. I'm not using it exactly the way I mean. Uh, we do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there. That has been our conservation model for the last century, and we want to keep doing that. Um, but we've got to go beyond that now. We've got to move in past conservation into restoration and rebuild functioning ecosystems in all those places we've dismantled them. A lot of people say, well, you know, there's no way you're going to put it back together again the way it was uh, before we dismantled it, and they're, they're probably right. Uh, but we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions I, I uh, started the talk with to create ecosystem function again, even if it's not exactly what was on a particular place at some point in the past. But to do that, we have to start with the, the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally, so we have to start with the most important groups. And there's two groups we can't do without. One is the flowering plants, and of course the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce 
they're capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into what is essentially the food, simple sugars and carbohydrates, the food of all the animals on the planet, almost all the animals on the planet. So let's just say plants are making, making the food that animals need um, and they're storing it in their plant parts, mostly their leaves. But if you don't get that food to the animals, you don't have any animals then you don't have functional ecosystems. Well, it turns out that most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants. Those invertebrates are typically insects and not just any insect. It turns out caterpillars are turning out to be more important uh, in terms of transferring energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That is the species of chickadee that's uh, at, at my house in Southeast Pennsylvania. What do you have here? Black capped chickadee? The chickadees all over the country, all doing pretty much the same thing. They're the birds at our feeders. Some of the birds at our feeders eating seed all winter long. And we tend to think that's all chickadees need is seeds. But actually even in the winter time, only 50% of their diet is, is seeds. Uh, the other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the winter time. And when it comes time to reproduce, uh, their babies can't eat seeds at all. And that is true for most of the birds that are out there. They cannot eat seeds. So the parents switch to invertebrates. Those invertebrates again are insects and not just any insect. Um, most of what they're feeding their young are caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And again, most of those insects are caterpillars. We do have data to support that, but I don't have time to show you. Let's just talk about why caterpillars are so important in these terrestrial food webs, particularly bird food webs. There's several reasons. The first one is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is exoskeleton. It's made of chitin, it's undigestible. Uh, and because they're soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird where they're young, they're pretty rough. The beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. And some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or get, get one, one caterpillar. They're nutritious, they're high in fat, high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. Uh, and a lot of beetles have really sharp edges too. Then finally, it turns out that, that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, you're a vertebrate, birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from, particularly during the breeding season? Well, from all the prey that they're bringing back to the nest. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. Uh, those first two bars over there are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets a worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of most bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? It's a good question. So let's go back to Carolina chickadee. There's a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count them. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one nest of a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of, of bird. And if you want chickadees to, to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, because in so many places, that's all we have is our yards, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. Chickadees and most birds forage very close to the nest, about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. 
And if we landscape in a way that does not have all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of, of uh, Rosenberg et al., that's the Smithsonian group, who said that uh, we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that require insects at some point in their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. So things like doves and finches and crossbills can actually make a little milk out of seeds, and they can reproduce without insects. And look, they didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. That doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. Uh, in the past, we've asked them to do one thing, that's be pretty. Now we're gonna ask them to do two things, be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. And there's no way they're gonna be ecologically functional if we don't put caterpillars back into our landscapes. So how do we do that? Well, you add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. Seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we choose, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it perfectly. That is a monarch caterpillar. Um, so you can have all of the uh, Asian ornamentals that we typically use. You can have calorie pear and privet and, and uh, uh, camellias and, and hostas and ginkgos, all the things we typically landscape with in your yard, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. You won't support a single monarch butterfly reproduction. The only thing that's going to support monarch butterfly reproduction is one of the milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? If you're gonna remember one thing from this talk, this is probably the most important thing. Um, plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there uh, in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants, so how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of interacting with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So if you take the milkweeds away from your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not gonna start to make a living on your hostas. It's locked into eating milkweeds and it has two choices then. Fly away and find milkweed someplace else if it can or starve to death. Turns out this is very simple. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that actually contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actually remove energy from local food webs. The very best contributor across the country in 84% of the counties in which it occurs is one of our oaks. We've got 91 species of oaks in this country. They are contributing more energy to food webs than any other plant genus by far. Now in Utah, you've got four species of oaks and the gambel oak is the most common. So it's a really important plant. Good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. Good ornamental plant, turns nice yellow in the fall but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to the local food web. Uh, and a good example of, of uh, a detractor would be any of the uh, invasive ornamentals we brought in that escape our yards, move into our natural areas, push out the native plants that do contribute and replace them with a plant that is not contributing any energy. So all I'm trying to uh, say here is that plant choice matters. If we're going to rebuild those ecosystems we talked about earlier, 
You're not going to do it unless you have a functional e uh, food web in that ecosystem. And that's not going to happen unless you choose the plants that actually pass on their energy. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well this works when we do choose the right plants. Um, starting with where I live, this is uh, where my wife Cindy and I moved in the year 2000 to a, uh, it was a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots in Southeast Pennsylvania. The last thing they did was mow it for hay. Uh, so there are very few plants there. And, and our, our goal was to restore this landscape. Although we knew nothing about that. We didn't know how to do that. I did know I wanted to see uh, if I could get some caterpillars that weren't there to make a living at, at our house. And the first one I tried was the Canadian owlet. I had never seen a Canadian owlet before. Uh, pretty little thing. The adult looks just like a, a leaf. Well, you're not going to have Canadian owlets unless you have its host plant, meadow root. And we didn't have any meadow root. Uh, I'm sure meadow root was there. The place had been farmed for 300 years, and I'm sure it was there before it was farmed, but long gone. So I got some meadow root seeds from someplace, and I planted them, and they grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owlets would be able to find my, my little patch of meadow root. So I didn't even go out and check it uh, for at least two months after I planted it. Then I walked by for another reason. I looked over, covered with Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. So now we've got a good population of meadow root and a good population of Canadian owlets. We've added two species to our, our uh, restoration. The restoration has begun. Same story with uh, this beautiful moth, the goldenrod stowaway. That's a, a misnomer. That's nothing to do with goldenrod. It's actually a, a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. Ditch daisy. We didn't have any ditch daisy, but I did know where there was some in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, last year they took over my front yard. That's okay. I had to wait a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my patch of Bidens, but they did. Uh, and now we've got a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. Want to see if we get the hackberry emperor to make a living at our house. Uh, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that ought to be there, but as its name suggests, it's a specialist on celtus, on hackberry. <clears throat> and we didn't have any hackberry, so I got a couple of hackberry trees, planted them. Had to wait four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry, but they did. Uh, and now we've added them, six species, and that's how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. Uh, and along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct Sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Where I live, there are 110 species of moths that uh, use goldenrod. It's a very important plant. I planted Virginia creeper. Now, at least back east, a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper, but I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color, good ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. Uh, it makes valuable berries, the little berries up there. And by valuable, I mean they are high in fat. Our migrating birds need sources of fat to fuel the migration. And uh, Virginia creeper berries are a good source of that. And of course, the overwintering birds need a source of fat too to make it through the winter. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moth caterpillars that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Wanted to see if I get the evening primrose moth to make a living at our house, just because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Uh, well, as its name uh, suggests, it depends on evening primrose, and we didn't have any evening primrose. So I planted it. The moth did come. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's, it's crowded, but it's very cute. And I planted a lot of oaks. Now, these are just examples of plants that I put back on our, our property, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. Uh, this is the uh, Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land, if you follow Martha. Um, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak uh, when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, you can enjoy it immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of the oaks on our property as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that create the caterpillars that run the food web at 
our house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the medium dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucalatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species have come to the oaks on our property. You should cat, uh, clap for oaks because they are the best plants. But here's an important point, they come right away. That's a pin oak that's just popped its head above, above the leaves there. And there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that tree. You may say, oh, it's gonna kill the tree. No, an oven bird's gonna come eat that caterpillar in the next 20 minutes. It helps make a viable food web at our house. Uh, now this is what our house looks like from taking from the same place I took that first picture um, in the summertime. Uh, we put, put some plants back, not all of them, we're still working on it. Uh, but my research has shown that, that if you know the number of species of moths, that bread and butter of terrestrial food webs, the number of species of moths in your local food web, uh, you have a very good index of how productive that food web is and how stable it is. So six years ago, I started to count the number of species of moths making a living in our house by taking a picture of each one. I've got them all in a PowerPoint if you want to see it. Uh, and I am up to 1,259 species of moths that are now making a living at our house that used to be mowed for hay. And believe me, there weren't that many then. We have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 29.4 million acres. So on one, get the math straight here, one 2.9 millionth of the land mass, uh, we're supporting 48% of all the moths that occur in the entire state because we put the plants back. And because so many of those moths, uh, the caterpillars of those moths are types of bird food, we have recorded 62 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. World Wildlife Fund says that two thirds of, of Earth's wildlife have, have vanished. We killed two thirds of the Earth's wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? I really think we can turn a lot of these headlines around. But I bet you're thinking, gee, you've got 10 acres. We just have small little suburban plots. Will it work on smaller properties? And that's an excellent question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0. 0.6 acres. 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They are in the middle of a development. They're surrounded by everybody with the big lawns. When they moved into their house, it was choked with, with Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle from Asia. So first thing they did was get rid of that. Then they planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds using their yard. And they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. If anybody's a birder here, you know that's a, a very good number. We've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house so far. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, her property abuts O'Hare Airport. She has one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. She is an island in the middle of Chicago. It's a pretty island because Pam is a native plant landscaper. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants. Then she said she, she sat back with a glass of wine and started to count the birds using her yard. Whoops, come back here. She's up to 124, actually it's 125 species now. Got to update this, that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we do want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to talk about those big lawns. Um, I don't know how much you do it here in, in Utah, but boy, across the country, we've got 44 million acres of lawn. That's an area bigger than the size of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, it's a status symbol and we have to display our Halloween decorations. 
But think about the four things every property has to accomplish if we're going to reach any kind of a sustainable relationship with the natural systems that support us. Every landscape has to support uh, a food web. Every landscape has to sequester carbon. Every landscape has to, to manage the watershed in which it lies. And every landscape has to support uh, pollinators. Lawn does none of those things. It's a total failure in, in all of those, those ecological goals. So what if we replanted half of the area that we have in lawn? We're not going to get rid of it. It's a good place to walk, but let's cut it in half. Let's take areas that look like this and turn them into this. I got this picture from Dan Getman. He lives in Missouri. I have never met Dan, but he said, look, I had this big lawn and I'm putting all these native plants in. Uh, so I'm doing it. Okay, well, let's make the math simple. Let's say we got 40 million acres. Uh, we're going to restore 20 million of those right where we live. That's enough to create what I'm calling a, a new national park, homegrown national park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge. Come back here, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks. It's still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park is going to be the biggest car park in the country. Um, what are the benefits from, from building uh, a park at home? Well, you get to interact with nature right where you live. It's your own time, your, your own pace. You can develop that personal relationship. Maybe one you had as a child uh, and then you've lost it, or maybe you never had it. You develop it for the first time. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people, there last year with you. So I know what you're really going to interact with. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic or government closure comes down the pike. There's no travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. And I think the alone part is important there, not mediated by somebody else. You're going to develop a unique relationship with some part of nature. And this is particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour to a natural area. Then they walk around for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right in their yard, all they have to do is go outside and interact with it, get to know it, fall in love with it, become friends with it, alone, no parental supervision. When we hover over our kids, we're sending the message that this is dangerous stuff. Uh, and, you know, this is something you should, you should fear. That is not the message we should be sending to the future stewards of the planet. If they're afraid to be a steward, if they don't know what good stewardship is, if they don't love being a steward, they will be a lousy steward. And we don't need any more lousy stewardship. And maybe we'll learn uh, uh, how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of grass with a hedge, but there are an old lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to very seriously tell me how to hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl slowly towards the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, but you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, and you learn how to take care of that lizard. You fall in love with that lizard, that little piece of, of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. <clears throat> but I guarantee she's going to remember those experiences uh, from her childhood when she grows up. And I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet. So our mission with Homegrown National Park is to motivate millions of people to regenerate biodiversity by planting natives, removing invasives, and reshaping uh, the, the, uh, our relationship with nature. Right now, we've got an adversarial relationship with nature. We want to make it a collaborative one. Uh, you can actually join Homegrown National Park. Go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and register your property on the map. Where you live and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. We want the whole map. Oh, and then your little piece of your county is going to light up with a firefly. <laughs> We want this message to go viral. All the people that don't know they're the future of conservation, we want them to hear about it. What are we asking? We really do want people to reduce the area of lawn because lawn is not accomplishing the ecological goals we need it to. We're gonna do that by replacing lawn with the native plants that do accomplish those goals. 
removing invasive species. A lot of people have invasives on their property and they don't even know it. If you're protecting any natural area, you wanna keep doing that. There are significant ecological products associated with homegrown national park, a significant increase in biodiversity. You can just look at what's happened uh, at, at our house, <clears throat> if you don't believe that. A measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody got rid of the invasives just on their property, nationwide, we'd be 78% done. We'd be 85% done east of the Mississippi. Good first step. Significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. Lawn is the worst. Uh, plant choice for sequestering carbon. So if you replace it with anything else, you're going to sequester more carbon and help climate change. And we're also starting to create viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Any bit of conservation we do outside of a park helps conservation inside of a park. There are also important sociological products associated with homegrown national park. National awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and, and what our roles in those solutions are. We really are trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional. It's essential for everybody. And because it's essential for everybody, everybody has responsibility to sustain it. We wanna convert hope into action. Hope is great, but action's better. And we wanna merge existing conservation organizations like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation, California Native Plant Society, all the land conservancies, onto one visual that we call the biodiversity map. So we can see how well we are doing uh, in terms of conservation on private property. Um, okay, we're going to uh, reduce the lawn, but what plants should we replace the lawn with? I'm gonna argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is, a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. So think of the keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up that house. They are the support system. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. Again, with the, the best uh, keystone plant across the country, uh, would be uh, one of our, our oaks. Um, and it depends on which, which county you're, you're in. You happen to be in one of the states that has the fewest oak species, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, cottonwood's really in, important. Uh, and if you wanna know what the best keystone plants where you actually do live uh, are, go to a tool we developed for the National Wildlife Federation, the Native Plant Finder, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important woody and herbaceous plants in your county will pop up. This is just an example of, of what you will get. So the old excuse, if I don't know what to plant, um, that's just an excuse now. You do know what to plant. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to uh, put in keystone plants, invite a lot of our insects to our house, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. It turns out that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines. Those are all the ways that, that lights are killing uh, our nocturnal insects, particularly the moths that create the caterpillars that run our, our food web. But to me, this is good news. It is good news because we have got to turn around. We've got to stop insect decline and turn it around. They really are the little things that run the world. And we've already lost 45% of the insects on this, this planet. If we can turn that around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick out there, but there's a lot of us to flick those, those switches. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I can't turn uh, the light off my, my barn or off my, my uh, garage or my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you'll notice is the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, even easier, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb, yellow LED, yellow uh, uh, incandescent. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects. If we were to switch out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do uh, uh, is to think about landscaping, particularly under our trees, in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is just an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. <clears throat> a few of them, like the polyphemus moth, 
complete the development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them finish growing as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree, wiggle their way beneath the soil, pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. It's messy. Uh, and we mow and compact the areas under our trees so that during the summertime, they're rock hard, very hard for those caterpillars to get underground. Those are oaks in that picture, which makes them an ecological trap. They're calling in the adult moths to lay eggs. The caterpillars develop, drop down, and die. And I'm convinced that there's another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. <clears throat> and this is what most people have. They got a tree in their yard surrounded by lawn. I got a new grad student uh, this year, Emma Jonas, who is measuring how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they're gonna do better in a situation like this, a layered landscape where you have a tree and then you have layers of the appropriate native plants that ought to be in your eco region, right down to ground cover. Uh, it makes soft landing. The caterpillars drop down uh, the ground is not compacted. Nobody's going to mow them. Nobody's going to step on them. I'm sure uh, they can spin their cocoon in the leaf litter down there. Much higher survivorship. Uh, former grad student Desiree Narango uh, did a, a wonderful study with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, and her results suggest there is room for compromise in our plant choices. And that's, that's good news. She had one simple question. How well do chickadees do uh, in suburban landscapes that are dominated by native, plant, native plants versus landscapes dominated by typical Asian ornamentals. Uh, and the first thing she found is when they're dominated by Asian ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They're 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Everybody had a nest box up, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from zero to 100%, this is what you get. We looked at woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. The dotted line there is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. And if you reproduce at that rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything above the line there, you've got a growing population. And if you make fewer babies, and that happens when you've got an awful lot of non-native plants there, then you have an unsustainable shrinking population. Now, right here, very liberally interpreting is where those lines intersect, which suggests you can have up to 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard non-native without destroying the local food web. And we can't tolerate any invasive uh, species. They're just ecological tumors. They escape and, and castrate our local ecosystems. But there's a lot of ornamentals that are not invasive. Remember Dan Getman? That's a ginkgo. Did you pick that up the first time? Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his native planting? because Dan's wife liked ginkgos and she said, put one in. So Dan did, but the question is, is that tree destroying the functionality of this landscape? No. Is it going to escape and wreck the woodlot? No, it's just there. So I tend to think of plants that are just there, not contributing anything, as, as like statues. So there you go, there's Dan's statue. <clears throat> now, if everything was a statue in Dan's yard, there'd be an issue, but it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those native plants that are contributing most of the energy. If we increase the percentage of them, we can tolerate a lot of the non-natives. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. Um, you don't get more formal than that. And every plant in that landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day and they love them over there. If they can love them in Europe, we can love them too. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban large yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a fence around. It formalizes it, it tells your neighbor it's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. 
It's pretty when it's in bloom. It's meeting the needs of several species of bees. It could be bigger, but if everybody did it, it would help. Help what? Help make pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? Well, the media will tell you because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually much closer to a 12th of our crops. And I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any, any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators and we need them everywhere we need plants because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. A few of those are, are, are agricultural plants, but pollinators are essential. We need them everywhere. How about this, a Drew Latham design? Imagine the amount of life here versus the amount of life here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can. More and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has been doing it for several years now. We've got a cost-sharing program encouraging homeowners to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular. Pennsylvania has a similar program. Uh, it's much younger. There's an island in Florida. I think it's Marco Island. It's paying people to uh, allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow on the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, uh, in my view, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species uh, on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an invasive species, endangered species. Speaking of invasives, let's put a bounty on. Uh, that's what, this is calorie pear, Bradford pear. That's what uh, St. Louis, Missouri did, Fayetteville, Arkansas, North Carolina. Uh, if you take out a calorie pair, you get a free tree replacement. Um, water utility is giving people $100 coupons to plant water efficient uh, native plants. Uh, and of course, the, the big uh, lawn reduction programs, particularly in California, that's going up now. You get $3 uh, rebate for every square foot of lawn you replace with xeric planting. California simply does not have the water required for that status symbol. And if you want more information on all of those programs, Memorize that. <clears throat> All right, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation and the first one's important. We're starting to think that nature is optional. We like nature, we like to hike in it, we like to go bird watching, ride our bikes, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, nature takes a back seat. And of course, resources are always in short supply. Push always comes to shove. So niche reached, nature is always taking a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the uh, uh, virus broke out and there's this wall sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We wanna save wildlife, save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for expanding the national park system. Beautiful places, we wanna save them so the future generations can enjoy it. And I get that, nature is enormously entertaining, but it is much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about that, but if we restrict conservation just to the places where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those places are too few, too isolated and too small. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments none of which are acting like a Persian rug, and that's what we've done to our, our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, and I don't like that language because it suggests there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including even much of our, our agriculture. So we have to glue our rugs back together again. I'll be done in a minute. We got to put our plants back. You can see them. Not just to make biological carters that connect uh, ecological uh, uh, habitats with each other, but to restore all those places where we, we've eliminated those habitats to begin with. And you know what? It's starting to happen. I'm seeing it all over the country. It is starting to happen. And when it does happen, it'll be the first time in human history where we actually, or at least in recent history, where we actually are coexisting with the natural world. Our third misstep is to leave Earth stewardship to a few specialists, not just a few biologists, few, few uh, ecologists. Um, it, we didn't make it an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, since every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. 
So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said the Western settler mindset was I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you are taught them. We have been very good at teaching this. We've been very poor at teaching both our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That does not mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. Now, more and more people recognize the earth has some serious issues, but they feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can get rid of their invasive plants, one person can modify their light system. There's a whole bunch of things one person can do to increase the ecological integrity of their landscape, and it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help your parents, help a park, help a preserve. They're all underfunded, they're all understaffed, they will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the responsibility. And we certainly have the power to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do so is going to determine nature's fate and eventually our own. So I think that I have I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.